In Mule Shoe, Texas, there was a guy whom everyone called Uncle Zeke. And he could not admit when he was wrong, no matter what. One day, old Uncle Zeke was walking along the street, and he happened to stumble into the blacksmith shop, and he saw sawdust all over the floor. What he didn't know was, was just before he got there, the blacksmith had pulled a horseshoe out of the fire, and had it, it had become increasingly uncooperative. He beat on it till it was no longer orange, but it was black. But it was still hot, but it just wouldn't cooperate. So he tossed it over into the sawdust until it cooled. Well, when Zeke walked in, he looked down and he saw the horseshoe. He picked it up, not knowing it was still hot. And naturally, he dropped it very fast. The old blacksmith looked over his glasses and said, Kind of hot, ain't it, Zeke? Old Zeke said, Nope, just don't take me long to look at a horseshoe. I'm glad I could recall a memory for you. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot to say about pride, and you know, uh, you know, somebody that says they're never wrong, and you know, I, I lot, a lot of times, you know, we think that way, right? And, and we're we're always right about everything. You know, the truth is we're not. Paul said, uh, no one is good, no, not one. And so, you know, if, if that's the case, then we're not right all the time. But we know someone who is, amen? amen. And so that's who we look to for our guidance and, and, and to humble us when we need humbling, which I would say is quite often. But we've been talking about uh, uh, accidental Pharisees and and how we can become one, and, and how to look at the signs if, if we are becoming one, and how to overcome that. And so th the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the dangers of having an overzealous faith and, and what that will uh, uh, cause in our lives or if, uh, if we're not really paying attention to it. And then also uh, last week, we talked about the, the curse of comparison. And so uh, the curse of comparison is when we look at other people and we start trying to compare our, our, our sin with each other. And, and, and we know that we can't do that. Uh, we can't compare our sin with each other. We know that God is the only one who can, who can look at our sin and, and judge that sin on that basis. And so there is some dangers in that. But today we're going to be talking about a byproduct. Now last week we talked about spiritual pride, those haughty eyes where we look down and we judge. And so... Uh, a byproduct of that spiritual pride is actually judgment. So we're going to talk about uh, judgment today, and we're also going to talk about how to overcome that by using, uh, using the Scripture properly and uh, a pr having a proper understanding of obedience. Uh, I think I've heard some of that stuff this morning. Uh, I overheard some of it in Dwayne's class, so I think y'all covered a little bit of that stuff. Um, and there might have been some of it in Johnny's class this morning, so... I know, I guess we're on the right page this morning, so uh, hopefully it'll keep going that way. So one thing we got to do is we got to look at this byproduct of comparison, and that's judgment. So if you would, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and this, this particular set of scripture, uh, or this particular scripture, is one of the most misused scriptures in the Bible. It's one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 1. We're going to look at verse 1 and 2. Now, what I'm about to show you is what most people see, or what most people say about this verse. <coughs> Do you notice anything about it? See, most people can recite this verse. 
Most people on the receiving end of judgment will say this. Judge not. That's what the Bible says. You can't judge me. Well, in some sense, they're right. But I think we need to examine it a little more fully. So most people look at it and this is all they see. This is, they, don't know anything, they don't know the rest of the scripture here. They just know judge not. But let's look at the rest of it. So this is what it's supposed to look like. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So as I said, most people, they can recite this, at least the first two words of it. Why do people, why do we do that right there? Why do we only recite the first two words of that? Why do we not recite the rest of it? Good answer. It, what it does is, see, when we recite the whole thing, it requires some, uh, it requires a measure of self-examination. How many of us like to uh, give ourselves a self-examination uh, of where we are? We don't. It's much easier when we judge somebody else. We don't like to judge ourselves. Do something with me right quick. I want you to point at somebody, anybody, just point somewhere. It don't matter who. You don't have to have anybody in mind. Matt's got a lot of fingers pointed at him. Uh, uh, honestly, I thought Mitchell would get a lot more, but uh, I was rooting for you, Mitchell. <laughs> now, all right, now, did you see how easy that was just to to point somewhere else. It's real easy, you know, it doesn't take a lot. My arms are sore uh, from cutting down trees yesterday using a chainsaw. And uh, my back's sore from having to use it. But it's still pretty easy to point. You know, it still works pretty free. <laughs> now, I want you to do this. I want you to take your finger, point it like that, and then turn it this way. It's a little harder, ain't it? It don't quite bend the same way. Some people might even hurt to do that. <laughs> see, the point is, see, that's, that's the whole thing. It's so much harder to point the finger back at us because it requires uh, a certain measure of self-examination. And so that's what Jesus, that's what he was talking about here, is that, you know, that's why it's so dangerous to judge because when we judge, we have to expect that same amount or that same kind of judgment in return. You know, when we judge, are we judging by the same measure? No. Because we don't know everything about everybody. We don't know why people do things that they do. Who are we to judge that? We don't know the heart. We've already talked about it. Only God knows the heart. So when we, when we start this, you know, this judgment thing, We've got to look at the fact that we can't judge in that, in that regard. There's got to be self-examination. So Jesus, he continued. And he diagnosed, there's, there's, a, there's a disease that he diagnosed here. It's called log eye disease. You ever heard of it? Log eye disease. Jesus talked about it. It's a deadly disease. See, here, here's, what, here's what Jesus said about this disease. He said, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? He says, well, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So Jesus is telling, you know, when we judge, you know, we got a problem there. We got this huge log sticking out of our face. But we want to look at the speck in somebody else's eye. Jesus tells us, he said, won't you take care of your problem first? 
But that requires self-examination. That requires to judge ourselves not on our standards, but His. And we don't like to do that. That's why it's so dangerous. Now, we spent the last three weeks kind of talk, or the, the last two weeks and a little bit this morning talking about pride. So I think you, you've got the idea, right? Pride is bad. Spiritual pride is bad. So what we want to do is we want to talk about how to overcome that. And what we do and how we do that is by having a proper understanding of the Scriptures and a proper understanding of obedience, because sometimes we get those mixed up. And again, we're talking about accidental Pharisees here, so we, you know this is where we're going to bring the Pharisees in and look at their example. Because that's what, we don't want to become an accidental Pharisee, and sometimes we do that. And we do that by looking at how we interpret how we look at the Scriptures, how we understand the Scriptures, and how we understand obedience. All right, so let's look at that. How do we overcome it? Well, a question I would ask is why, that, why is it that Christians who seem to know the most about Scriptures and who are the most obedient seem to be the most prideful? Have you ever noticed that? The people who know the, who know the most about the Scriptures and who seem to be the most obedient seem to be the most prideful at times. Why is that? That was the issue with the Pharisees. Douglas is right. And we're going to discuss that a little bit more in depth here in just a second. But part of the answer is likely how we view ourselves. So let me ask, I want to ask a simple question. Just with a simple raise of your hand. Now look, these are not trick questions, okay? These are not trick questions. They're just simple questions. So let me ask this. With a simple raise of your hand, how many think that you are below average in your morality? Okay, we got we did get we did get a few honest people. Thank you. With a simple raise of your hand, how many think you're average in your morality? Okay. Now, with a show of hands, how many of you think you're above average in your morality? <laughs> now see the thing is though see I asked this question to a different crowd one time and I got a different answer but see I didn't ask them to raise their hand in public I had them, I had them fill out a card with the same questions and guess what over 90% of them filled out that last question that they thought that they were above average I would guess that if I gave you that same card and you did it in private, you might answer a little bit different. I was part of the 90% that checked above average morality. So we have a certain view of ourselves. That's just inherent. We, we view ourselves as all well and good, don't we? Because we don't like to see ourselves any less than what we are. And so a lot of times we make ourselves a little bit better, including our morality. Now, if Jesus was here judging each of our moralities, what do you think his answer would be? I guarantee you it wouldn't be where we think it is. So part of this is looking at the Scriptures and what they said. Now, one of the things to tie this in with the Pharisees, is that this was the Pharisees' problem. This was the issue with the Pharisees. Now, if you notice, anytime Jesus is talking with the Pharisees, he never rebukes them about what they know. He never rebukes them about what they know, because they know a lot, don't they? They do. He never rebukes them for that. So knowing things, knowing uh, scriptural things, not an issue. What did, what did he have a problem with? How, he, how they treated people, but how they used the scriptures themselves. 
So when we have a proper understanding of the Scriptures, it will keep us from becoming accidental Pharisees. Now one of these things uh, that we have to look at, well, there's two things. There's two wrong ways that we use Scripture. And so let me show you that. So we're going to have a proper understanding of the Scriptures. Now, typically, this I'm going to show you a picture. This is how we typically view other people's sin. <laughs> That's some big binoculars, ain't it? See, when we look at other people's sins, man, they are magnified, aren't they? Man, their sin is so much bigger than mine. All right, so that's, that's one way that we use the Scriptures is that we, we use Scripture to magnify other people's sin while minimizing our own. Now, truth be known, this is probably the kind of binoculars we ought to be using. The kid kind, you know, the ones that don't work, the ones that don't magnify anything. But that's one way we use the scriptures incorrectly is we use it to throw in and, and zoom in on other people's sin and make their sin much bigger than our own because when we do that, it makes us look better and it makes us feel better. That's not a proper way to use the scriptures. Another thing that Christians do that the Pharisees did as well is that they use the scriptures as a prop to prop themselves up above others. Look something like this. Now there's a saying, you know, there's a, a song, you know, standing on the promises of God. Well, the Bible's full of promises of God, so there's nothing wrong with that. We should absolutely do that. But when you stand on the Bible to look down at other people, that's not a correct usage of Scripture. Because if Jesus uses the Scriptures to look down on us, He would find the same problem in us that we find with other people. See, sin is level. That's how God views sin. It's level. There may be different consequences that come with those sins, with each sin. But when God looks at sin, sin is sin. Another thing that we do when we prop up uh, the Bible, use it as a prop, is sometimes we do this is that when we know so much about Scripture that we make it tough for people to pick up. We make it hard for them to grasp the Bible because, you know, we talk about how much we know about the Bible and how hard it is. Well, Jesus talks a lot about, you know, making it so that kids might understand it. We make it difficult. What was one of the problems that the Pharisees had? They would make laws on top of laws on top of other laws. They actually made it a burden to try and follow the Lord. See, when we, when we take the Bible and, and, and we take the Scriptures and we make them so big or so hard to grasp for other people, we're doing a disservice to the Scriptures because the Scriptures are not just for me. They're not just for me to grasp. They're for all of us. He gave the word of God to all of us. He says that when we accept him as his savior, he writes the law on our hearts. Everybody in here is uh, living and breathing this morning. That means your heart's working. So that same law that I got in my heart if you've accepted Christ, that's the same law that's in your heart. So we have to be careful that we don't use the Scripture in the wrong way. We have to understand the right way in which to use the Scriptures. So let's look at what is the right way to look at Scriptures. Turn to James chapter 1. James is uh, Jesus' brother. Later on, after James 
became a follower of Jesus because originally he wasn't. Jesus' brother James scoffed at him. Read through the scriptures. James didn't take his brother seriously. He scoffed at him. He didn't believe that he was the Messiah. But after James became a believer, he had his own trouble with the religious elite. James writes this. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For if he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So think about this, uh, friends. When we pick up this word here and we read it, are we only retaining the things that tickle our ears? Or, or, or we might be retaining the things that will help us to grow in the faith. Things that will overcome judgment and pride. Things that will overcome sin. Are those the things that we retain? Because I think for a lot of us, that's what we do. We only retain the things that tickle our ears and make us feel good about ourselves. I look in the mirror and I said, man, you are a handsome devil. <laughs> and I can't forget it. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to have special prayer at the end of this for me for my humility. <clears throat> you need some water, Jeanette? She was choking a little bit there. <laughs> but you don't tend to forget what you look like when you look in the mirror, right? No, you don't. Most of us, we like what we see. So, why do we treat the Bible that way? We look at this like a mirror and say, hmm, man, I like that right there, but I sure don't like that. I think I'm going to forget that part. See, James is saying there that, you know, when we look at this, He said, don't just be hearers of this, but be doers. And see, when, when we're prideful and, and we have this judgment and, and we're using the scripture in the wrong way, suddenly we become hearers and not doers. Because if we were doers, we would extend that grace, mercy, and love that Jesus is talking about so much. You notice that, you notice that Jesus didn't really talk a lot like that with the, the sinners that he met. Remember Jesus, he, he talked very kind. Now, he spoke truth to them. Remember, he told them, you know, when he might tell them what their sin was, and he'd tell them, go and sin no more. He told them that they were forgiven, that he loved them. But notice who he was always getting on to. The Pharisees, because they used the Scripture the wrong way. They used the Scriptures to beat people up. They used the Scriptures to prop themselves up to make themselves look better than everybody else. We tend to do that because we forget what we read. We forget about all that love and mercy and justice that Jesus is talking about. See, Jesus demonstrated that to the people he met. He demonstrated that to the sinners that he uh, conversed with and that he ate with. But he reminded the Pharisees of what they were doing because they should have known better. He told the people in the midst of the Pharisees, he said, listen to what they say, but don't do what they do. Because he knew what they were doing. They were hearers of the word and not doers of the word. And so we need to be careful that we don't become like Pharisees and only be hearers of the word and not doers of the word. Now, talking about obedience and having a proper understanding of obedience. Again, we will look at Pharisees for that example. What does the Scripture say about obedience? Well, 
I'm going to ask four questions, and I want you to tell me if this is a sense. Is scriptural obedience going to church? Is it reading the Bible? Is it memorizing verses? Is it tithing? Is that what scriptural obedience looks like? Well, let's see. To an extent, yes. Is going to church scriptural obedience? Well, the Pharisees were regulars at the synagogue and the temple. So they were regular church attenders. What about reading the Bible? Well, Pharisees, they read the scriptures a lot. They had to. Was it memorizing Bible verses? Well, the Pharisees, the mo most of them had the entire Old Testament memorized. It's a lot of scripture, ain't it? So they definitely had, they had the Bible memorized, their Bible. Was it in tithing? Well, Jesus touched on that too. They tithed better than anybody else. They gave a tenth of their money. They gave a tenth of their belongings. They even gave a tenth of their garden. So they were the top tithers. So when you look at what Jesus had to say to them, did they have a scriptural definition of obedience? But they did all those things. How many of us can put ourselves right there? Man, we're obedient. We go to church. We're obedient because we read the Bible. We're obedient because we've memorized some verses. We're obedient because we tithe. Look what Jesus says. Turn to Luke chapter 17. Because this is, this is a hard scripture. There are certain scriptures that are really hard to take in the Bible, and I think this is one of them. Because Jesus really puts it in perspective. He really puts in perspective what being obedient is. Luke chapter 17, starting with verse 7. Jesus said, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come in at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And after, afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. So all of these things that were mentioned, going to church, reading your Bible, memorizing verses, tithing, those are all things that we should do. But here's what Jesus is saying. How many of you, how many of us, including myself, how many of us pat ourselves on the back for doing these things? I bet all of us do. I bet all of us walk through the doors every once in a while, man, we pat ourselves on the back. Sometimes we've got a cast on because we broke our arm trying to pat so hard. I'm just as guilty of that. But is that scriptural obedience? doing what we ought to be doing anyway. It's like showing up for work. D does anybody in here, when they show up for work, do you get a round of applause? Do you get a thank you? No. You know why? It's because they expect you to do certain things. One of those things is to show up, and the second thing is to work. You're supposed to do that. These things that Jesus mentioned, the things that the Pharisees did, the same things that we do and, and, and call that obedience. Jesus is telling us that true obedience is doing this, but more. 
not thinking because we do these things, we're better than anybody else. Because most of the time, that's what it leads to. Most of the time, we get to the same place that the Pharisees were at because we do these things. These are things we have to do anyway. These are things that we should do anyways. We don't get extra credit points for doing what we should be doing. what we should be doing instead of beating people down with the scriptures is building people up. See, that's what Jesus did. He built people up. He was not shy about letting people know what sin was. And if they had sin in their life, he wasn't shy about that. But he also showed them love and compassion because his goal was to build people up because he wants people to be with him. He doesn't want to send anybody to hell. The fact is that there is people going to go to hell because they don't want to accept that. But we ought to be using the scriptures to build people up, not tear them down. And see, the thing is, going back to the original part of this about judgment, that byproduct of spiritual pride, when we start judging other people and we zero in on their sins and make them bigger or, or we use it as a prop to make ourselves better, we're doing everything Jesus said don't do. He told, he told us, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Let's not be accidental Pharisees because we misuse the scriptures and we misuse obedience. Jesus expects us to go above and beyond, not just what we're supposed to do. Last week we talked about being servants. Only God is God. We are His servants. And we should be doing what servants do. But He asks us to do more. He asks us to do more. To not only be a servant of Him, but be a servant to each other. How many of us are servants to each other? When we remove that judgment, that spiritual pride from us, we will be much better servants. And we will be much more obedient to the Lord. We will continue this next week same question I ask every week are you an accidental Pharisee let's all stand for a closing prayer